What's up? What's up? Welcome back to the Five Seconds on the Clock podcast with your boy Brandon Williams. And today we'll be doing a college football preview. Stay tuned. So today I'm going to start off by talking about the tiers of college football. I feel like there are three tiers of teams who could legitimately compete and make it to the college football playoff and maybe even win a national championship. Of course, tier one is only two teams. Only two teams belong. Alabama and Clemson, the cream of the crop in college football for sure. That's undoubtedly, you can't really argue that. You can argue the past four or five years, they've been the best team. Well, you really can't argue. It's it's a fact. Um, so they're the top two teams. They have a bunch of starters returning. Um, of course, Tua Tunga Viola is returning at quarterback for Alabama. And then Trevor Lawrence is returning for his sophomore season as the QB for Clemson. Um, so those are the top two teams in tier, tier one. That's tier one. That's it's only a two-team list. Now, Tier 2, these are teams who have competed, um, have been in the college football playoff within the last, you know, three, four years consistently, but they haven't, you know, been as dominant as Bama and Clemson. Um, I'm going to start off with Oklahoma. Oklahoma has three playoff appearances in the five years since the college football playoff has been around. Um, but with that being said, they have never made it to the national championship game. They've always lost in the semifinal. So, you know, they kind of can get over the hump. They have Jalen Hurts now. They're the quarterback. Um, he transferred in from Alabama. Um, now maybe, maybe he can lead, you know, Oklahoma back to the playoff and maybe get to the championship game because he has been there. So he does have that experience on that level. My second team on tier two, Ohio State, the Buckeyes. As I said in the intro to the podcast, I'm a huge Buckeye fan. But they have two playoff appearances, two playoff appearances since the playoff has started, and they won the inaugural college football playoff national championship. You remember Zeke was unstoppable in that game. He had Carter Jones, the great story with the the QB uh, carousel that the team had that year. Braxton Miller was hurt, wasn't able to play that year. And then JT Barrett came in, had a great season. It was a Heisman candidate. Then he got hurt in the last week of the regular season in the game versus Michigan, and then Carter Jones came in. And then he had that great game against Wisconsin, the Big Ten Championship. Then he had the great game against Bama. Then, you know, Zeke, you know, he was dominant in those last three games as well. Um, and then they eventually won the national championship over Oregon that year. Um, my next team I have is Georgia. Georgia only has one playoff appearance. One playoff appearance. They lost to Bama, but, you know, that was a great game. That was an overtime game. That's when Tua came in in the second half in his freshman season and won the game for the tie. And I was actually at that game. Um, I was there volunteering. I was there the whole week volunteering. Um, Tua, when Tua came in, it was like the energy just changed in Mercedes Benz Stadium. It was crazy, and then he like they took over because, of course, Georgia had that that double digit lead going into the second half. But then when Tua came in, he brought the team back, and they eventually won it after his pass in overtime to win the game. Now tier three. These are teams that I think they have a chance to break through every year, but they never really do it when it matters the most. So I think. This could be the year for these teams, but this is things that we said, you know, college football playing, uh, college football fans and analysts have said over and over, like this team could break through this year. But these are teams who have had a chance, but they haven't done it. I'm going to start with LSU. LSU, they have Joey, Joe Burrow, uh, the transfer QB from Ohio State. He was great for the Tigers last season. Uh, they went 10-3, and three, um, and they finally found like – it seems like they finally found that quarterback – who can really run the offense because before they've always had a great defense, even a running game and even great wide receivers, but the, they've never been able to figure it out at the quarterback position. I think Joe Burrow is really, really that guy for them. And his, his, this is his second full season with the team and he'll be the starter. So I think LSU has a, has a, a chance to make it this year, but you know, of course they had to beat Pamela in the sec Then they just got that gauntlet in the sec West. So it will be hard for them, but I think they could make it, it could break through this year. It, it'll take some some major strides, major steps for that team. But, you know, they had Grant Delpit on the other side of that ball, one of the best defenders in the country, um, certainly the best defensive back in the country. He's all over the field. His impact is always felt. So I think the Tigers do have a chance to make some noise this year and potentially make it to the college football playoff. But it will be tough in the SEC as they have to make it to teams like Georgia and Bama who have been there and done that before. The next team I have in Tier 3 is Florida. Now, the Gators have already opened up the season. They played Miami down in Orlando. They won that game by a score of 24-20. to 20. Um, The defense looked great. They looked stellar. Felipe Franks made enough plays to help Florida get that win. 
Now, they're a team that I believe, just like LSU, if they can get some of those big wins on the schedule in the SEC, they could break through, they can make the playoff, and maybe win a championship. You know, defense wins championships, and those two teams have two of the best defenses in the country. So if Florida and LSU can win those big games on the schedule, they could potentially make noise in the playoffs and even maybe win a national championship. But it's not going to be easy. It's easier said than done. When you have a gauntlet, not just, you know, Bama, not just Georgia, it's other teams in the SEC that are going to compete and give you their all every week just because you have a target on your back. The next team in Tier 3 is Michigan, or as I call them, the team up north. Michigan, they have Shea Patterson returning at quarterback. Um, The defense, they did lose some big players like Rashawn Gary, Devin Bush. They lost Winovich, all those guys. They lost those to them to the NFL. Um, but they still have a good team, and a lot of people were saying, you know, since Urban Meyer has gone from Ohio State and Ryan Day, the new coach, has taken over, um, that this might be the year Michigan can finally beat Ohio State, make it to the Big Ten Championship, and maybe make it to the playoffs. And I see that. They could, it could happen. I mean, as a Buckeye fan, I'm, I'm not really going to pay it that much attention because we know how that rivalry has gone, you know, in the past really two decades. It's, some play, it's to the point where some people – Analysts and players for Ohio State and future players for Ohio State are saying they don't even see it as a robbery. I'm always going to see it that way because of the hate I have for Michigan, just because it is a strong and intense and long robbery. But some people are saying just because of the dominance by the Buckeyes in these last two decades, it might not even be a robbery anymore. But we'll see if Michigan can make those strides and maybe win the game this year. The game, you know, Ohio State versus Michigan is known as the game simply. But um, I, I just I just think this could be the year for Michigan. Well, honestly, let me stop. I don't think that. It could be. Look, Just looking at the team, looking at the roster, um, it's some uncertainty in Ohio State as far as new head coach, new quarterback, Justin Fields transferred in from Georgia. But honestly, I don't think they're going to be my Buckeyes. I'm going to just say that right now. The last team I have on Tier 3 is Washington. Washington has won the Pac-12 championship the last two years. And they made it to the college football playoff two years ago where they lost to Bama. And then last year they made it to the Rose Bowl where they lost to no other than the Ohio State Buckeyes. But Washington has Jacob Eason. He um, transferred from Georgia, and he's going to be their starting QB this year. So he's a former five-star recruit, so there's going to be big expectations out there in Seattle for UW. The Huskies might have a little bit more competition this year. Um, Utah, they came in ranked number 14 this year. They have a great team, and then you have USC. We'll see what Clay Hilton can do with um, USC. JT Daniels is returning as a starting quarterback, so we'll see if USC can return to those glory days. You know when they were, um, you know, competing every season. I feel like USC can at least make it to a point where they're going to be competing in the Pac-12 conference every year. That shouldn't be a problem because, like I said, they always get these blue chip recruits. They still you know, dominate recruiting in the West and especially in California. So I think USC will be able to return to form, whether it be this year or a couple of years down the line is yet to be determined, but we will see. And that wraps up my top three tiers of college football. So let's recap. Tier one, of course, Bama, Clemson. Tier two, Oklahoma, Ohio State, Georgia. Tier three, LSU, Michigan, Florida, Washington. Let's see how those predictions go. I'm really excited to see how these teams perform this year. Now, it's only four spots in the college football playoff, so every team won't be able to make it, but I still want to see how each team plays this season. If they, if those teams that I said might break through, if any of those teams are able to do it this season, if any of those teams go upon their performance from last season, or if any of those teams like Michigan, the team up north, if they can finally get over the hump and beat their rival. Now to my prediction for which team will win the championship in all five power conferences. First, I'm going to start with the ACC. And, of course, I'm going with the Clemson. I really don't see them losing any game on their regular season schedule. I think they'll run the table. They have a tough matchup versus Texas A&M Week 2. But I don't think Jimbo Fisher has the Aggies at the level where they're ready to compete with teams like Clemson. Kellen Mon is a nice quarterback. He's a dual-threat quarterback for Texas A&M. But they're just not on Clemson's level yet. And yes, Clemson has a tough week three matchup on their schedule in the Carrier Dome against Syracuse. And yes, I'm a Syracuse alum, so I will be rooting for Syracuse to win a game. But in my honest opinion, 
I think Clemson is going to blow out Syracuse in the dome. Now, that game is going to be sold out. You know, it's a bunch of hype around Syracuse because the Orange have made it tough against Clemson the last two years. Two years ago, they did beat Clemson in the dome. And last year, it took a late draw by Clemson to take the lead before they eventually won that game. So it has been a tough matchup the past few seasons. But I think Trevor Lawrence is going to be in the groove of things by week three. He's going to be ready. And I think Clemson is, Clemson is going to come in and take care of business. Sorry, Orange Nation, but we're not there yet. Let's be honest. Moving over to the Big Ten now. I have Ohio State winning the Big Ten. And no, I am not being biased. I just think they have too many weapons and a lot of starters returning on defense. A lot of people are high on Michigan this season, and Ryan Day is in his first season at the helm for the Buckeyes. But you, but if you look at the talent on the field, I don't think anybody in the Big Ten can compete with Ohio State. They do have tough games at Nebraska. They host Michigan State. Penn State also comes to Columbus, and they have to travel at the end of the season to Ann Arbor to play Michigan. But I have them running the table as well, and I think they'll beat Wisconsin. I think Wisconsin will be able to make it to the Big Ten championship game and represent the West. But I think Ohio State will beat Wisconsin in the Big Ten championship game in Lucas Oil Stadium, a.k.a. the house that Peyton built. Now from the Big Ten to the Big 12, Oklahoma has Jalen Hurts at the QB now. He transferred from Alabama, and I think he's going to excel in Lincoln Riley's offense. I think OU will keep it up on the offensive side of the ball. They'll keep some of that 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 intensity that they had with Baker Mayfield and Kyler Murray, who won the last two Heismans and went on to be the number one pick in the last two drafts. I don't know if he's going to, you know, reach Eclipse, you know, all of our expectations and reach that level, but I think Jalen Hurts will have a great season this year. Texas will be a definitely be a competitor in that conference. Um, Texas beat them last year in the Red River rivalry before Oklahoma beat them in the Big Ten Trump championship game. But ultimately, I think Oklahoma has the pieces it takes, and they will win the Big 12 again this season. So that's my prediction for the Big 12. Now let's go to the Pac-12. And I know I said Washington was had the potential to be one of those breakthrough teams this season, but I'm going against that. I'm actually picking Oregon to win the Pac-12. I just love Justin Herbert at QB. A lot of experts had him projected as the number one overall pick in last year's draft. If he would have came out after his junior season, he could have been the number one pick and not Kyler Murray. But he's returned. he returned for his senior season. We'll see how he does this year. But I think he's just going to be on an upward climb. I think he has the potential to be a Heisman candidate this season. Oregon is going as a team. On that defensive side of the ball, they're doing, they're doing great at recruiting. They got the number one recruit from last season. So Oregon has a bright future, and I think – their success could start sooner than later, and this season could be that season for them. If Herbert performs how we think he does and if that offense, I mean that defense steps up, they could compete for the Pac-12 championship and maybe even make it to the college football playoff. The Pac-12 has been left out of the college football playoff, but this season they could return. And last but not least, the best conference in college football, the SEC. I'm going with Bama, of course. I mean, Georgia is going to compete, but after that embarrassing loss in the national championship to Clemson last season, I think Bama, Tua, Coach Saban, and that entire Bama roster will be motivated to come out this season and prove that they are still Bama. Clemson, you might be on the same level as us, but you're not a notch above us. We are on the same level, and we might even be better. Now, news did come out this week that linebacker Dylan Moses will be out for the season. He tore his ACL, so that will hurt Bama. He was going to be their leader on the defensive side of the ball and definitely at the linebacker position. Um, they have some true freshmen who are going to try and fill his role, but I think the team overall is going to be able to overcome that, and Bama will come out of the SEC, and I have them beating Georgia in the SEC championship game for the second year in a row. So those are my predictions for the champion of every Power 5 conference. But of course, it's only four spots in the college football playoff. So at least one of those teams will be left out of the playoff. And speaking of the playoff, I have Clemson as the number one seed. Bama is the number two seed. Ohio State, the number three seed. And Oklahoma, the number four seed. Clemson will be Oklahoma in the Peach Bowl. Trevor Lawrence is going to shine again. I have Clemson winning by a score 34 to 24. Bama will take on Ohio State in the Fiesta Bowl, and for this game, I see a shootout. 
I know we know Bama is a defensive team. Since Saban's been there, they've been known for the dominance on the defensive side of the ball. But we saw what the offense was able to do last year when Tua took over. And then you have guys like Jerry Judy on the outside, Najee Harris was returning. So I think the offense is going to remain at that level that they were last season. In Ohio State, they have weapons all over. They have Justin Fields coming in, replacing Dwayne Haskins. But they have offensive weapons at every level, tight end, wide receiver, and running back. And they even have, you know, the H-back position that you can say Urban Meyer created. They have, you know, weapons at that position as well. So I see a shootout. I have Bama winning 45-41. to 41. And Yes, I know that's 86 points in the college football playoff game. But I think it's going to be a high-scoring game, two dominant offenses. And I think Dylan Moses not being there really will affect, you know, Alabama's defense throughout the season. I think Ohio State could take advantage of that. But I still have Bama winning that game. And then I have Clemson beating Bama in the national championship. Again, I don't think it's going to be a 28-point blowout like it was last season, but I think Dylan Moses, once again, I'm going to keep bringing that up because he is such a big and integral part of that defense. Him not being there is going to really hurt the team in the big moments. Against, you know, lesser competition or teams who they should beat, I think they'll handle that. They'll take care of business. But against teams like Ohio State, it could hurt them. Against teams like Clemson, it could definitely hurt them because we saw what Clemson did to a, a fully healthy Alabama team. And now with him not being there in that middle, in the middle of the defense to anchor that team and lead that team, it's going to affect them. So I have Clemson winning again. Closer game, like I said. I think the score will be 33-24. to 24. Clemson comes out on top and will be the two-time defending champions after the end of this season. And Trevor Lawrence will be two for two. Two years, two rings. So that's my prediction. We'll see how that goes. But I'm pretty, pretty confident in that. Now let's move on to the Heisman favorites for the upcoming season. Of course, I have Trevor Lawrence from Clemson up there, Tua from Alabama. I also have Jonathan Taylor, the running back out of Wisconsin. He's due, a, he's due for a breakout season. I mean, not really a breakout season because he's consistently performed in his first two seasons, but I think he's going to keep that up. Jonathan Taylor, look out for him in the Heisman race. Jake Fromm from Georgia. He's in his junior season now. He's made it to the national championship as a freshman. And then last year, he made it to the SEC championship game where they lost to Bama. He has, but he has great experience in big moments. Jalen Hurts transferred from Bama and went to Oklahoma. Um, the last two guys to transfer into Oklahoma, Baker Mayfield, Tyler Murray, ended up winning the Heisman. Let's see if Jalen can keep that trend going. I have Sam Ellinger, QB out of Texas as well. Um, he's a dual-threat quarterback. He's definitely tough. He kind of has some Tebow in him because he's willing to run the ball, you know, at the goal line and get those 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 needed yards. If it's fourth and one or something like that, you can bank on him doing a QB power and taking it and get that yard. I'm going to have Justin Herbert, QB out of Oregon. Like I said, he's going to be one of the top five, if not top three, maybe number one overall in the 2020 draft. So Justin Herbert, he's definitely going to have a great season. He's going to put on a show. And Oregon, maybe, as a team, they can win the Pac-12 and maybe sneak into the college football playoff. I have Justin Fields, QB out of Oklahoma, QB out of Ohio State. Excuse me, I can't get that wrong. I should know this. Um, he transferred from Georgia because he did have to sit behind Jake Fromm, the starter. But uh, Justin Fields, he Justin Fields was the number two overall recruit. Him and Trevor Lawrence were one and two, and he's so talented. He just didn't get to get on the field as much as he wanted to in Georgia because he already had a talented starter ahead of him, and he knew that he would at least have to wait another season but he wanted to get on the field so he was granted the raver to transfer and play immediately i think he's going to have a great season he has great weapons around him i don't know a better situation for a transferring quarterback i mean you can say maybe jalen hurts but i think the weapons that ohio state has even eclipses what oklahoma has on offense this season i'm um, then i, I kind of have some dark horses some guys at different positions because you know usually when you think about the heisman favorites you're going to go quarterback one because they always have the ball, of course. Then maybe running backs, because running backs get plenty of the carries. They have a chance to, you know, pad their stats, of course. But I'm going to go Jerry Judy, wide receiver out of Alabama. Now, if Jerry Judy has a great year, that means uh, Tua is going to have a great year as well. And that might, you know, kind of cancel Jerry Judy out. But Jerry Judy, he's the best route runner in college. I mean, those cuts he puts on against the defender in the open field, you do not want to be against Jerry Judy. And I also have a wild card on the defensive side of the ball. Grant Delpit, I mentioned him earlier. He's always flying, flying around the field. His impact is always felt. He's in the box, like the zone. He can play man. He's, he's just a great defensive back, and his presence is always felt. And depending on what level he performs at this year, he could make that trip to New York and be a Heisman finalist. I know it's you know it's something outside the box. You know it's something that doesn't usually happen, but it definitely could this season if Grant puts on a show 
and LSU is able to make it to the playoff, I think he could definitely be one of the finalists. Now to the last segment of today's podcast. I'm going to talk about the best jerseys in college football. Um, 24-7 sports analyst Brad Crawford rated the top 25 jerseys in college football. I'm just going to give you the top 10. According to Brad, number one is LSU, number two, Ohio State, number three, Michigan, number four, Penn State, number five, Oregon, number six, UCF, number seven, Georgia, number eight, Texas, number nine, Notre Dame, and number 10, TCU. According to Brad's list, it seems like he likes the nice, clean, traditional looks. I like them as well, but a little flash never hurts. You know, I think I like a little flash, you know, those Multiple colorways, different designs. I like that. But listen, let me give you my top ten. Number one is Oregon. Come on now. Best color schemes. Phil Knight, founder of Nike, is an Oregon alum. And they have so many color schemes to mix and match. I mean, it's not really a debate. I mean, maybe Brad, like I said, likes their traditional look. But come on, Oregon, they definitely have the best jerseys in college football. No debate. Number two, I kind of went with his route, though. I went Notre Dame. I love the classic gold helmet. The classic gold helmet and gold pants are almost unrivaled. The look is just clean, and you're going to associate that with Notre Dame every time. Number three, I went with the Buckeyes. Kind of a traditional look as well, but what really stands out to me is the Buckeye leaves on the helmet. Um, and I also like the all-black jerseys as well. They released those a couple of years ago, and I'm lo- really loving the black jerseys. They're going to wear those again this year against Michigan State, so I'm looking forward to that. Number four, I have Penn State. I just like the clean look with the one stripe on the helmet and no names on the back of the jersey. I really like that. It's like, to me, it's almost like the name on the front of the jersey is bigger than the name on the back. Even though they just have the logo in front and not like Penn State. I just think I like that message that that they're giving off. Five, I have LSU. I really like that they wear the white jerseys home in a way. Like no matter where they play, they're going to wear the white jerseys. They also wear the purple jerseys. Every now and then, every blue moon. But I really love when they do. I really like the purple. I think they should wear it more. I mean, the white is their tradition. is clean. It's nice. But the purple jerseys, they're cold for real. Number six, I have USC. Once again, it's kind of a classic look. But I really like the no names on the back of the jerseys, just like Penn State. I don't know why I like that so much. But I really do. Seven, I'm going to go with Tennessee. Tennessee, those orange and white jerseys. Oh, my goodness, so clean. And they even added the gray alternate jersey recently. But the orange and white jerseys? And when they play at home with that checker end zone with those jerseys? Okay, come on. Come on, Brad. Come on. You got to do better than that. Number eight, I got Michigan. I like the helmets. The best parts of the uni are the helmets. But that's all the compliments I'm giving to Michigan. There you go. Number nine, Maryland. I like the state flag on the helmet and the shoulder pads under armor has gotten them together here recently i really really like maryland's jerseys now um it's, it's you know and of course you know if you have a nice jersey that can help you recruit and i think maryland is going to benefit from that going to get more recruits um it's those guys that might lead the dmv for schools like ohio state like Dwayne haskins did um they might be able to keep them you know not just because of the jerseys it has to be a culture and stuff like that but the jerseys definitely can help recruit Number 10, I have a tie. I didn't know which one of these teams I wanted to pick. But my podcast, I'm making my own rules. Okay, 10A, got TCU. The color schemes and the horn frog inspired design. It's just hard. It's hard. I love it. And 10B, I have UCF. They have the gold knight on the helmet. I mean, come on now. Come on. You got to respect that. And then they added a lot of alternate color, uh, color ways in the last few years. And I'm really liking what they're doing as far as that. And, um. Uh, you know, the success that they had recently is great. Um, I hope Mackenzie Milton gets healthy for them. You know, he went out last year with that devastating injury and wasn't able to return. Um, they just named Brandon Wimbush, the transfer from Notre Dame, as a starting quarterback this year. But I, um, I'm praying for him and hope that he can fully recover and maybe get back on the field one day. But, yeah, that is my top ten for the best jerseys in college football. That's also the last segment today. Thank you guys once again for tuning in to the five seconds on the clock podcast. We'll be back next week. We'll be back soon. Stick with us with a lot of fun and exciting content. I'm not going to tease it yet, but I am going to like release a tease during the middle of the week. So you guys can have a little idea of what to expect. Once again, thank you for tuning in. I really appreciate all the love, support, and feedback I have received so far. Signing out for the 5 Seconds on the Clock podcast. It's your boy, Brandon Williams. You dig.